This week, we're starting a new series of lessons on the Epistle to the Romans, and this is Lesson 1. The Bible verses for today's lesson are chapter 1, verses 1 through 7, and 13 through 17. As I said during the introduction, I will be reading from the English Standard Version, but if you'd like to read from your own translation, just pause the video until you found the passage. Let's get right into the lesson. Romans chapter 1, verse 1 says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. As is typical for his letters, Paul identifies himself in the opening sentence. We've previously discussed the fact that Paul really had two names. He was born Saul of Tarsus, but at some point after his encounter with the resurrected Jesus on the road to Damascus, began to call himself Paul. It only makes sense that since he is writing to the Romans, he would identify himself by his Gentile name. Also typical of his letters, Paul used the dual identity of servant and apostle to demonstrate that his authority for writing rested not in himself, but in Christ, who had saved him and called him. Paul wanted his readers to know more about him than just his name. He wanted them to understand who he was. The verse says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus. That word servant is the Greek word doulos, and it's much closer to slave than servant. It's someone that is in a permanent relation of servitude to another, someone whose will was completely subject to the will of another, someone who belonged to another. The phrase, a servant of Christ Jesus, made it clear that Paul considered himself to be owned by Christ. By placing the title Christ before Jesus' name, Paul emphasized the rightful authority of the Messiah. Does the bond servant or indentured servant have the right of self-determination? No, they don't. Verse 1 says, call to be an apostle. Paul says he was called by Jesus to be an apostle. He's not saying this out of ego or pride. Rather, he's saying that he was called by Jesus and sent out for his purpose. What was that purpose? The verse says Paul was set apart for the gospel of God. That's his mission, the gospel of God. While we normally think of the gospel as the good news of Jesus, Paul also understood that the gospel belonged to the Father. It was God's good news of salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. For that purpose, Paul had been set apart. Romans chapter 1, verses 2 and 3 says, which he promised beforehand through his prophets and the holy scriptures concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh. If you go back and pick up part of verse 1, it says, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets and the holy scriptures. What does that mean? God had promised for hundreds of years through scripture that he would send the Messiah, his anointed one. Humanity had been promised a savior. God issued his promise through his prophets by means of the Holy Scripture. The verse goes on to say, who was descended from David according to the flesh. Why was it important to recognize that Jesus was descended from David? Because it fulfills the prophecies in the scripture. It fulfills the promise. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 and 13 says, When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. This is one of the Old Testament verses that's pointing to Jesus. The Pharisees even knew that the Messiah would come from the lineage of David. That's why the genealogy of Jesus that's stated in Matthew chapter 1 is so important. The verse says, according to the flesh. We've said that even before the incarnation of Jesus, God had given humanity, which was lost, the promise of a Savior. As God the Son, Jesus was eternal, existent, and equal with the Father. But in taking on human flesh, Jesus fulfilled the Father's promise to provide salvation for human beings. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8 say, 
have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Jesus Christ, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. In other words, Jesus could only make atonement for human sin by becoming man. Romans chapter 1 verse 4 says, And was declared to be the Son of God in power, according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 4 starts by declaring that Jesus was the Son of God. By saying is the Son of God, does that somehow mean he's less than the Father? No, even the Jews understood that being the Son of God meant equality with God. John chapter 5, verse 18 says, This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God on his own father, making himself equal with God. It's important to remember Jesus did not become the Son of God at Bethlehem. He was the God the Son throughout eternity. In verses 3 and 4, Paul is describing Jesus as fully human, and fully deity. The verse says the Son of God in power, and power refers to the omnipotence of deity. The final witness to Jesus' divine nature is illustrated at the end of verse 4 by his resurrection from the dead. God declared Jesus to be a son by raising Christ on the third day following his crucifixion. Just as important is Jesus' role in the resurrection of the dead. Jesus will raise from the dead every person who believes in him. His power in the resurrection of the dead is his testimony that he is truly the Son of God. Romans chapter 1, verses 5 and 6 says, Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Paul received both grace and apostleship through Jesus. Did Paul earn these things? No, of course not. Paul didn't merit God's forgiveness just as none of us do. Only by the grace of Christ can anyone be reconciled to God. God's grace not only was vital to Paul's salvation, but also to his apostleship. Paul never claimed to be an apostle based on anything that he had accomplished. He accepted this role as a grace gift from God. Verse 5 tells us why Paul was called to be an apostle. He was to, quote, bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name. Paul used an interesting phrase to describe salvation, the obedience of faith. Salvation does not come from the obedience of works, but rather obedience is the result of faith. Obedience belongs to faith and cannot be truly experienced aside from faith. Who was Paul supposed to bring to the obedience of faith? The verse says, all the nations. The Greek word translated nations doesn't carry the meaning that we would expect. Today, if you said all the nations, it would literally mean everyone, the entire world. But the Greek word ethnos means all nations except for the Jews. Early in Paul's ministry, he preached primarily to the Jews, but they rejected him. When that happened, he moved on to his ultimate mission, the Gentiles. Verse 6 ends, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Paul wrote to both Jewish and Gentile Christians who made up the church at Rome. He emphasized that these Gentiles in the church were also called by Jesus Christ. Salvation was not the exclusive claim of Jewish Christians. Romans chapter 1 verse 7, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. Having provided greetings and offered the basis of his authority in the first six verses, in verse 7, Paul addresses the recipients of his letter. While aspects of his opening remarks focused on the Gentile believers, the epistle was intended for all the believers in Rome. The phrase, to all those in Rome, could be taken to mean everyone in the city, but he clarifies it with two qualifications that make it clear he is writing to the, first, the church in Rome. First, Paul says that the members of the Roman church were loved by God. 
the Christians in Rome had had up to this point experienced some serious opposition, but assaults by the Roman government had not yet peaked. It was going to get worse. The persecution had not yet forced the Jews to leave Rome en mass. Still, conditions were not good. The believers needed to be encouraged in the knowledge of God's love for them. Second, the people that Paul was writing to were called to be saints. The word saints comes from the same root as holy. Believers are to be known by their likeness to their Savior. His righteousness and holiness should be reflected in their lives. In an introduction familiar to most of Paul's letters, he acknowledged his desire that the people experience both grace and peace. Both come from the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. By God's grace through Christ, we are able to be at peace with him. We also re really receive inner peace through Christ. Romans chapter 1, verse 13. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as amongst the rest of the Gentiles. Paul addresses the Roman believers as his brothers. Although he had yet to meet them personally, he wanted to convey affection and respect. Also, Paul didn't want them to think that he had overlooked them in his missionary journeys. He made sure they knew that he had often come, often intended to come to Rome, but he had been prevented. Paul didn't elaborate how he had been hindered, perhaps by the Holy Spirit. Paul reaffirms his desire to visit the Roman church. But Paul didn't just want to enjoy the fellowship of the Roman Christians. The verse says that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. Paul wanted to reap some harvest among them. In other cities where he predominantly served among Gentiles, Paul had seen God's work in extraordinary ways. Although he also suffered in many of these places, most notably Iconium, Lystra, and Philippi, the gospel thrived and churches were born. Chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Because of his calling as an apostle, Paul was under an obligation to share the gospel with all people. This compelling motivation wasn't because of a sense of debt, but was his strong desire to fulfill his calling. Paul wanted to be faithful to the Lord who saved him and called him into the gospel ministry. Paul says that he's, quote, under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians. Paul is writing his letter to the church at Rome, so at first glance, this doesn't seem to make any sense. Paul's phrase in the following one about the wise and foolish is probably something called an inclusio, a technique used by biblical writers in which two extremes are used to show that everything in between is also included. Using the term Greeks, Paul likely meant the well-educated people who would be influenced by Greek culture and language. Using the term barbarians, Paul went to the complete other edge of the cultural spectrum. Paul continues by saying that he's under obligation to both the wise and to the foolish. This is an example of Jewish parallelism, where the author says something a second time that really means the same thing, but uses slightly different words. The reference to Greeks could parallel the term wise, while the barbarians might be considered foolish. Paul's point was that he felt obliged to share the gospel with all people, especially the church of Rome. Indeed, verse 15 says, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Since the message of Christ had already been at work in Rome, giving rise to the Roman churches that Paul is writing to, his reference to the gospel wasn't exclusively evangelistic. As we'll see in the rest of this letter, Paul believed the Roman Christians needed further clarification regarding the meaning of the gospel. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Paul says he isn't ashamed of the gospel. While others might be timid concerning the faith, Paul boldly declared the good news of Jesus Christ. The power of God was not merely in the preaching of the gospel, but in the gospel itself. 
Paul says that the gospel is, quote, the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Notice that this phrase is both inclusive and exclusive. It's open to everyone. That opens the way to salvation to all people, regardless of their race or background. But the phrase, everyone who believes, limits salvation to people who place their faith in Jesus. Paul says that the gospel is open to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The term Greek here should be understood in the same way as the term Gentile. It really means anyone who is not a Jew. You could think that Paul was being prideful when saying that salvation had first been offered to the Jews. But in reality, that was all according to God's plan. The Jewish people received God's word through Moses and the prophets. God intended for Israel to be an early missionary nation carrying his name to all people, and that calling has passed on to us today. Knowing the truth of the gospel, we as believers should have the same boldness that comes from conviction. And like Paul, we should be able to stand before anyone and confidently share the good news of Jesus. Next week, we'll discuss lesson two. The main theme for that lesson is ignoring God leads to destruction. The study verses for next week's lesson are Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 28, and verse 32. If you don't already have a study guide, they're available at the church. As I understand it, the church will be open during normal business hours if you'd like to go by and pick one up. As I leave you, I pray that you are all well, that God protects us and not only keeps us safe, but gives us wisdom, empathy, kindness, and most of all, peace during these very trying times. I hope to see you soon.